are you curious what the research is in terms of teaching students with autism to demand for information or request using WH questions like what, where, who, how, why? We're covering that today. I'm Dr. Mary Barbera, autism mom, behavior analyst, and best-selling author. Each week, I provide you with videos to turn autism or signs of autism around. So if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, you can do that now. So today, I'm sharing a short excerpt from a podcast interview, podcast number 182, with Dr. Sarah Lachago, who um, is an associate professor in Texas, she runs a verbal behavior clinic and she's a researcher uh, on the topic of manding for information. So let's watch this short clip. And another thing that people, uh, I don't think that they forget, but maybe that it's not at the top of their mind because they're so focused on their learner getting the questions right is make sure that they're using the information. Mm. So does it help them? Are they learning something new? Um, for two reasons. One, if they don't, then the man for information or the question is not functional. It's sort of meaningless. And two, it also gives me information, gives me information as the teacher about whether they remain motivated, right? So if I'm teaching you to build a volcano, so we use a volcano chain because I have yet to have a student who does not like it. And I hide something that you need to do it like a spoon, like we did in the study. And they say, well, where's the spoon? And I say, oh, it's in the yellow drawer. And they go get it. And they're like, that's good. And then they set it down and don't finish. Then that might tell me, oh, that's not very meaningful to them. Like they don't care about this volcano. I need to move on to something that matters to them. Um, or they don't know what to do with it. They don't even know how to follow the direction. I got to go, whoops, they're not meaningfully using this, this outcome, this consequence. I got to address that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a lot of work to set up, you know, yes. scenes of things, especially yeah. when you're talking about how and why. Um, yes. You know, earlier that where and who were among the easier uh, tests. What about what and which, which both of them are in my video blog? I, I always thought what and which were a teeny bit easier than where and who. Where and who are tougher for sure. Yeah. Um, well, where, where is okay? It's okay. Cause that's just a location thing. So that I, uh, that one's pretty easy in terms of, um, I can hide something. If there's something that's meaningful to you for any reason, and I can make it not there, then that's great. That's all I need. Who, um, so who usually is one of those, uh, we, we sort of, uh, linked it to the where. So it was, um, where's the spoon? Oh, you know what? Someone else has it. Mm -hmm. Who has it? Uh, but there is probably other ways. That's the thing for each, each question type. There's a few ways to contrive um, that, that motivation. And, right. and, and that's something for people to think about because I urge people when you teach to contrive it under multiple different types of motivation, um, which we call a sort of multiple exemplar learning. Like I want to teach under all these important conditions so that you're not stuck just only doing it under one condition. Um, and trying to teach what, where, who, all at the same time using a volcano um, or, or multiple ones, or are you trying to teach how under multiple activities or Such empirical oh. questions. No, these are great questions. Uh, the, the research literature on this, and it's, it, here's, what, here's what's so interesting. This is a ubiquitous skill. There's no denying how important it is. But when you look at the research literature, it's relatively small. When you look at actually the verbal behavior research literature, it's relatively small compared to the ubiquity and importance of the subject matter. One of the reasons is there's not tons of people who are just, just you know, with the benefit of being really well trained to, to, to do the research. It's not easy. I mean, I, it's not easy. It's challenging research to do. And I think you're asking great questions. I love the question about, should we focus on teaching more than one man for information at a time? 
I actually think so. And that's a study that I want to do. I know that um, recently Jessel and um, uh, Je uh, it's, it's Jesse Jessel and Aner Ingverson just published on um, what's missing, where is it sequence. Mm -hmm. um, and both are man's for information. So what's missing, this is missing, where is it? It's here. Um, uh, Tina Seidner and her co-authors did a really great study where they taught um, man's for items and then and where I think it was where man's for information using scripted prompts. And so the idea behind that study was so they had three conditions. If they're playing with a child and their favorite toys, if the child's um, the control condition is to have the child have access to all their stuff, so they shouldn't ask for anything at that point. Then to demand for the item if they see the experiment or playmate has it it's within view. And if it's out of view, in that instance, then teach them to ask where is X right where's the ball. Um, and so they uh, in this study, the children, I think, were already able to man for the items. So the way the way they taught it was kind of intermixing both the man for information, where is the item, man for location, and the item itself, which I think is really neat because you're establishing a discrim an important sort of discrimination for the learner from the start. And so I think the next lines of study should be evaluating some simpler man's for information um, or maybe man's for the items and a couple different types of man's for information at the same time to kind of get that discrimination or get them to understand the difference mm -hmm. between the questions from the beginning. Right, because otherwise we get scrolling, which is, you know, yeah. going through the different responses. Who has it? Where is it? Who has yeah, it? Where is it? My son does that. It, yeah. will. it can do that. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it just makes a mess of language. So, you know, Sarah's here. She's an expert. Like, you, if you get in there and you start getting your prompting to, for, this child to ask, how are you? He's answering the question. Like you have to stop. <laughs> you have to go back. Like my son, yeah. when he was little, you know, we, somebody taught him, it was probably my idea. Got, you know, somebody sneezes and God bless you. And then if he sneezes, you know, thank you. You're welcome. And then when somebody would sneeze, it was God bless you. Thank you. You're welcome. It's like, yeah, we have a problem, you know, but if, if nobody's like going, wait, that doesn't make sense. That's an error. We're prompting an error. We need to go back. Is that important? He doesn't, this kid didn't want the information about how I was doing. He, he would, it would be a, been a better exchange for me to just say, how are you doing? Yeah. Have him answer. So really I'm, I'm just a big proponent, like use common sense. Like, you know, it's really important that children and adults ask ask for things they want and need. Yeah. Answer questions about safety, answer questions about things they know and care about. Yeah, keep you it know. functional. Yeah, keep Make it, it meaningful. Functional. I hope you enjoyed that short excerpt with Dr. Sarah Lachago, who um, gave us some great information about manning for information. If you would like to learn more about how you can help your child or clients who might be intermediate learners and might need information like manding for information, prepositions, pronouns, all sorts of things. I would love it if you would attend a free workshop at marybarbera.com forward slash workshop and consider joining our online course and community. If you like this video blog, please leave a comment, share it with others, give me a thumbs up, and I'll see you right here next week.